Let's go over some key elements to flexibility. So flexibility definition is the ability of a joint to move freely through the range of motion. So we're talking about muscle lengthening and the mobility of the muscles. And we also need to consider joint structure. So joint structure is genetic, it's unchangeable and it can limit flexibility to a certain degree and it also plays a role in injury prevention and injury rate. So muscle lengthening, uh, we're talking about the connective tissue, so you have collagen and elastin. Those are the two main types of connected, connective tissue we have in the muscle. So collagen, if we looked at it underneath the microscope, would be those little white fibers. They provide the overall structure they're holding the myofibrils together, they're holding the muscle fibers together, they bundle everything and provide the overall structure. So you can think of them like the scaffolding. And then you have elastin. So elastin, if we looked at it underneath the microscope, it would be the yellow fibers and they're kind of interwoven within the collagen. They allow the muscle to stretch to lengthen but recoil back to its normal shape. So think of it like elastic in your waistband functions or has similar functions. So we have the sarcolemma, also called the myolemma. They have interchangeable terms. Endomycin, so that's the myofibrils. Perimyosum is muscle fibers and epimyosum is the muscle itself. So let's look at this real quick so you can kind of get a visual of what I'm talking about. You have the muscle fibers, so you have all the muscle fibrils bound together with connective tissue, so there's that white connective tissue. And then you have all the muscle fibers bound together with connective tissue and elastin because it's got to be able to recoil and then all of those are bound together with another layer of connective tissue that makes up the muscle. So we have layers of connective tissue. Your connective tissue actually accounts for about 30% of the overall muscle mass. And now let's talk a little bit about joint structure. Genetic, unchangeable, can't do a lot about it. And what I'm referring to, some people are called double jointed, so they have increased range of motion. But anytime you increase the range of motion of a joint or the joint structure, you create instability. So yes, they can go further than the average person, but by the time they go too far, it's too late and the damage is done. So ligaments, you have all the ligaments binding the joint together and then you have a joint capsule around it. Uh, we have a synovial cavity with synovial fluid within it. You have articular cartilage here on the surfaces of, of the bone that face each other. Think of those like Teflon. So, and think of the synovial fluid like a lubricant. So like an oil, it's not, but think of it that way. And if you get dehydrated, your synovial fluid content can go down. It's more likely over time that the articular cart cartilage could come in contact, especially with high impact activities. And you could break off a little piece of that articular cartilage and get some trash inside the joint. So we hear of people getting their joints scoped and some of the um, damaged particles removed that is more than likely what has happened. And so this articular cartilage can wear off, especially if you get trash within the joint where little pieces have broken off due to high impact or other disease related issues. And they get in that synovial fluid causing friction and can wear down the articular cartilage. And then you don't have that nice smooth Teflon coat. And then you've got bone against bone and then the joint is just destroyed, causes a lot of pain. But the ligament itself, once it tears away, has to be surgically repaired. There's no way for it to heal on its own. So if you've heard of people um, taking out their ACL or PCL and having to go have surgery, that's what's happened. Instead of 
just stretching the ligament beyond its normal limits, they've actually torn it away from where it's attached, and that causes instability within the knee joint if we're talking ACL, PCL um, ligaments. But you have uh, a tendinous attachment that goes over the joint capsule in most of your joints but that's just looking at the overall structure. But really what we want to be concerned about for this chapter is notice how the ligaments connect bone to bone and then your tendons are going to connect muscle to bone. Alright, so types of joints. So we have plain joints like you see between the vertebrae. You have a saddle joint like you're going to see in your wrist. You have hinge joints like in your elbow and in your knee and then you have pivot joints and you'll normally see that also in the wrist where the radius and ulna have to go past each other like when you turn your wrist you have ball and socket joints so like your shoulder or um, where the femur goes into the hip and ellipsoid joints so like at the base of the skull so that you can turn your head so we have a lot of different kinds of joints. Um, the majority of our injuries are to knee joints, ball and socket joints, are, are probably some of the most common sport related injuries. The knee is a hinge joint which is a really stable joint but it has so much weight bearing down on it and then when you plant that weight or you have that high impact with all the additional weight of the body on it and then you twist and turn that's how we get ligaments torn, like ACL injuries, PCL injuries, all those associated ligaments that are commonly injured with uh, sport-related injuries. Uh, the shoulder is injured quite often because it has a wide range of motion, just like we were talking about early, earlier. The reason the hinge joint is so stable is it doesn't have a lot of range of motion. It's got really one movement, whereas the ball and socket joint pivots and can move around and it has a wide range of motion so that creates instability. You don't have that bony structure and a lot of muscles to support it and it tends to be injured in sport related activities. So types of stretching that we're concerned about, static, dynamic, ballistic, and PNF stretching, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. and so static stretching is what you're normally going to see um, when it comes to traditional fitness related activities. So if you see individuals in a yoga class holding a static position or they're in a fitness class and they hold a static position, that's static stretching. You get to the end of the range of motion, stretching out the muscle, you hold it for a short period of time, you may repeat it several times but that's static stretching. Dynamic stretching would be something like a kick. Like if you were in kickboxing and you were doing some low kicks to try to warm up the muscle, calisthenics can be considered dynamic stretching because you're going through a range of motion. They have the addition of muscle strength is important. Muscle endurance is important with dynamic stretching because you have to have the strength in order to lift the limbs sometimes to do certain kicks but you're going through the range of motion. So something like Pilates, if you want to compare yoga versus Pilates. So traditional yoga has a lot of static movements, whereas Pilates has taken some of the static movements from yoga and turned them into dynamic movements, where yes, you are still stretching the muscle, but you're going through a range of motion. Then you have ballistic stretching. You see this a lot in gymnastics, explosive movements plyometric in nature. The For a long time, up until recently, even the American College of Sports Medicine did not recommend doing ballistic stretching. Now they've kind of changed up their protocols and it's back in to normal recommendations, but with caution. So you want to make sure that you don't tear the muscle. The most important aspect or safety aspect when it comes to ballistic stretching is when you're at the bottom of the stretches, you can activate a proprioceptor called the muscle spindles. 
that tells the muscles to contract. So if you're bouncing and you get to the end of the range of motion where your muscles just can't go any further and you activate the muscle spindles and they tell the muscle to contract right at that moment, you could tear a muscle. That's the reason you need to use them with a little bit of caution. PNF stretching, also used in gymnastics. So a good example of this would be somebody laying on their back, another person grabbing their leg while they keep the other leg on the ground, and they take that one leg towards their head until they meet resistance. Once there's tension in the muscle, the person being stretched, the person laying down, pushes against the other person to contract the muscle. That activates another type of proprioceptor called the Golgi tendon organ, the GTO. And it has the opposite effect of muscle spindles in that it tells the muscle to relax. It's a safety mechanism so you don't tear your muscle away from where it's attached. So they contract the muscle for about 10 seconds and then they stop the contraction and then the person holding the leg can push it closer to their head a little further and then you just keep repeating the process a lot safer than ballistic stretching. It may be slower, but it's a lot safer. So let's look at the Golgi tendon organ and where it happens. So it's used in PNF stretching, found in the tendons, the tendinous attachments of the muscle that are attaching the muscle to bone, and it tells the muscle to relax. So another good example of that is, let's say I'm a power lifter, and I'm gonna curl a lot of weight. I know that's not a traditional powerlifting move, but let's just say I'm curling a lot of weight and I'm causing the bicep to contract. And you may have seen this happen before in some YouTube videos. So I start to curl and then all of a sudden the muscle just gives out on me and just relaxes. That, he, that person probably activated the Golgi tendon organ to prevent that muscle from tearing away from where it was attached. The tendon got stretched. It activated the Golgi tendon and then it sent a signal relax to the muscle and so the muscle relaxes. Now if that doesn't happen, let's say they contract really fast or maybe they're on steroids and their tendons haven't caught up to the muscle growth, they can tear that muscle away from where it's attached. They can tear that tendon away from where it's attached just because of rapid contraction or the muscle wasn't fully warmed or like I said before they had unnatural growth due to steroid use. Muscle spindles activated by stretching the muscle, but instead of being in the tendon, they're in the muscle itself. They cause the muscle to contract. So again, if you're doing ballistic stretching or a movement where you get to the end of the range of motion and you activate these muscle spindles, they could tell the muscle to contract right at the bottom of that stretch and then you tear or rupture the muscle. So stretching before explosive events can actually impair your performance. So if, if I'm a kickboxer and I want to go in and I'm competing in an MMA or a kickboxing event and I do a lot of static stretching before that event, I can actually impair my performance because I could activate the Golgi tendon organs by stretching. And it could slow the contractile time so I may not have powerful kicks. Another example would be a sprinter. So I go and I do a lot of static stretching. And by the way, static stretching has not been shown to prevent injury before a workout. But it can impair your performance on certain events. So I go in, I'm a sprinter, I do a lot of static stretching. I may actually slow my sprinting times down because I have lengthened the muscle and I'm going to slow the contractile time down because the Golgi tendon organs have been activated. So injury prevention. The best thing you can do is for short term, like let's say I'm a beginner, I'm going to go in and work out, I don't know how to prevent injury. The best thing I can do is get on a treadmill or do some light calisthenic movements to warm the muscle up. I can use dynamic stretching as long as I don't go all the way to the end of the range of motion. So I could do some small calisthenic movements, small kicks, what have you. Get the muscle warm, then I do my main activity, whatever I'm gonna do, and then as part of my cool down, I do my static stretching. That's fine to do it as your cool down, because really, 
Research has shown that there is no difference between somebody that does static stretching prior to work at, working out and somebody that goes in cold, meaning they don't do anything at all. They just jump right into the event. They have the same rate of injury. So one popular study looked at one group that did static stretching prior to working out, another group did nothing, just jumped right in, and another group did a warm-up. I think it was five or ten minutes, can't remember, it's right off the top of my head. So anyway, the group that did static stretching and the group that did nothing at all had the same injury rate, but the group that warmed up had a significant lower injury rate. So that tells us that warming up prior to exercise is beneficial. We actually get something from it. Now, I'm not saying you won't prevent injuries by using static stretching to lengthen your muscles and have a greater range of motion. I'm just saying that depending on the event, it could inhibit your performance. And there's no difference if you're trying to use it as some sort of warm up in injury prevention you should do it at the end of your work workout. Now there is a lot of research that shows individuals that are more flexible throughout the course of their lifetime have a lot less injuries. Because if they fall the wrong way, they're less likely to tear a muscle. They're less likely to have resistance from those muscles that may cause the muscles to break or to tear a ligament or to tear a tendon. So yes, you can prevent lifelong injuries by being more flexible, but you shouldn't use static stretching to try to warm up. Use dynamic stretching. So go in, use dynamic stretching, no ballistic stretching because you can activate the muscle spindles and you don't want to activate the Golgi tendon organs by static stretching. If you use dynamic dynamic stretching instead of just walking on a treadmill or doing a light jog, make sure you don't go to the end of the range of motion. You shouldn't feel any tension in the muscle. Just let it warm up by getting blood flow to the muscle. Cool down. That's the best time. If you're going to do your static stretching, get those muscles warm because you'll be able to go through a greater range of motion because that blood supply gets in the muscle, it hydrates the muscle, and you're less likely to tear the muscle because you'll have a greater range of motion. That's the same reason why a lot of individuals that do yoga in the afternoon may have greater gains, increasing their flexibility faster than people that do yoga in the morning. It takes individuals longer to get those muscles warmed up in the morning Whereas the person has been move, that has been moving around most of the day, I'm not talking about individuals at a desk job, but people that have been moving around most of the day have those muscles warmed up, they're pliable. So when they go into that yoga class or they go into that fitness class and they're flo focusing on stretching, they get a greater range of motion each time they do the stretching because those muscles aren't as tight and rigid and they're hydrated. So muscle strains, this is big. So you really want to pay attention to the difference between strains and sprains. Right now we're dealing with tearing the muscle or even tendinous attachments close to the muscle. So mild damage, less than 5% of the fibers, minimal loss of strength and motion. So you still have functional use of the muscle. Generally, generally going to take about two to three weeks to get some sort of improvement, get back to normal. Still want to rest, ice, compress, elevate, but lower recovery time. Grade two, now we have extensive damage. You're going to see bruising. You're going to see blood underneath the skin, a significant loss of strength. It may take two to three minutes. The muscle has really ruptured. So you're, you're going to see some discoloration and some bruising in that area. It's minor internal bleeding. That's what you're looking at. Rest, ice, compress, elevate. You may have to take some pain relievers, ibuprofen to keep inflammation down. And then you have a grade three, which is complete rupture of the muscle or tendon. It may have even pulled away from the bone. Some individuals of grade three have to have surgery to repair it. It's not going to heal back on its own 
when that muscle tears and rolls up, probably the most common injury is pulling a hamstring. That pulling muscle of the hamstring, especially in sprinting events, somebody pulls it. I had a really nasty picture of Chuck Liddell where somebody shot in on a single. He tried to sprawl, but they had the leg, and he tore his hamstring. And the whole underside of his leg was a deep, dark purple. I don't know that he completely tore it away, but I know he completely ruptured the muscle, and it had a lot of internal bleeding. I'm going to think... I'm going to assume he was somewhere in between grade two and three, probably more grade three, because I doubt he recovered in two to three months from that, fully recovered. I don't think he had to have surgery, though. All right, flexibility and age. This is a big one. As a lot of us get older, the number and size of muscle fibers decrease. If you go back to um, previous chapters where we talked about increasing protein uh, amounts of protein in your diet, or the dietary requirements of protein for somebody over 50, this is why. Because we're losing muscle mass. Water content and the tendons de decrease, so they're not as pliable. Elasticity of tendons, ligaments, joint capsule, even the muscle itself, the elastin within the muscle starts to diminish. Muscles start to shorten and get tight, reduce circulation, prone to muscle strains and tears, and then you may have other joint-related diseases. All of these can affect flexibility as we age. So if you've ever seen a runner that never stretches, I'm talking about a long-distance runner, one of the biggest issues they have is that their hamstrings start to shorten. And then they also have lower back issues because they never focus on those hamstrings. Hamstrings get really tight with individuals that do a lot of long distance running and don't have some sort of flexibility plan in place after the event. So they, they should always stretch after a long training sessions or after all their training sessions. But this is big. You need to pay attention to it because it's really going to, or it can really have an effect on longevity. When you start having problems moving around you're going to have other hypokinetic diseases that start to develop because you can't, you're not active enough. Your quality of life goes down. So if you don't already, if you're an athlete or you just like to work out, you need to have flexibility training as part of your regimen. It doesn't have to be extensive. It can be something that you take five or ten minutes as part of your cool down every time you work out you should at least have some sort of static stretching in your workout plan as part of your cool down to prevent a lot of these issues. So I know with me, I'm, I'm in my mid-40s now. I have less injuries than some of my friends in their 20s and 30s, mainly because they're not flexible. So when we're out and we do things, and, and especially like when I'm wrestling on the mat and I take hard hits and I fall the wrong way, I'm less likely to get injured because I don't have really tense muscles. I can go through a greater range of motion, which they can't, and they end up pulling a muscle. So it, it, I can see it even in my own life. Flexibility, being flexible through the majority of my life has really paid off because I can continue to play sports that most people my age can't. And I attribute that a lot, not just to my fitness, but a lot to my flexibility. So electrolytes and cramps. So as the muscle, the muscle obviously has a lot of hydration within it. As it gets dehydrated, we start to sweat, we start to lose electrolytes. So the big ones are sodium, potassium, chloride. Those are the ones that you're gonna see in most of your sports drinks. Sodium's a big one. And then what happens is we start having problems with those electrical impulses that are controlling the muscles. And so you start having spasms, you start having cramps, and then those can lead to muscle strains. Like if you're working out, you're dehydrated, have that electrolyte imbalance, you're just drinking water, and then all of a sudden you have a muscle cramp due to electrolyte imbalance, and that muscle spasms right when you're going through the range of motion, you can tear a muscle, or at least um, cause it to cramp up, which could cause pain for the next few days, or if you tear the muscle, pain for weeks, if not months, like we saw with the 
um, the different levels of muscle strains. So one thing we did not talk about, I kind of skipped over here, is sprains and strains. Spra sprains versus strains. So we did talk about strains to muscles and tendons, but sprains are to ligaments. So ligaments connect bone to bone, and you can sprain them. You can get swelling. You probably twisted your ankle. That's what we're talking about. And then you have the muscle strains, like what we were talking about earlier, where you have a tear in the muscle or a tear in the tendon, or you've stretched to beyond its limits. So they are two separate injuries. Sprains are two ligaments, and strains are to muscle or tendon. All right, American College Sports Medicine recommendations for flexibility exercise at least two to three days each week to improve range of motion. Hold that stretch for at least 10 to 30 seconds and repeat it several times. So two to four times. I do two just to save time, but I'm going to be teaching multiple classes. So I'll get the quantity I need depending on the amount of activity classes I teach. And then you've got static, dynamic, ballistic, PNF. All of those are effective. Be careful with ballistic. And then flexibility exercises are most effective when the muscle's warm. We've already talked about that. The best thing you can do to remind yourself so that you can knock out two birds with one stone is to put it into your workout. It's part of your cool down. If you do that, you'll be more consistent. So you warm up. You do your main activity, whatever it is. If it's weight training, if it's cardio, it doesn't matter. But at the end of each one of those sessions, you spend about five or 10 minutes stretching. And don't just stretch the lower body, stretch. Try to get some full body activities. There are plenty of flexibility routines on YouTube. So you should have no problem finding a professional trainer that does this for a living, that has the proper qualifications. It's best to take a class so that you don't do something that's contraindicated. But if you don't have access to that because you're a poor college student like I was when I was in college, y'all have YouTube now. You have access to some of the best trainers in the world. 